In recent years, it seems the whole world has fallen in love with Japanese cuisine. And one of its key ingredients is a type of seaweed called kombu. Scientists think there are around 20,000 species of seaweed. They include many varieties of kombu, a type of kelp. Japan is encircled by the sea, and kombu has been harvested since ancient times. Kombu is more than just a food. It is also a symbol of good fortune. This time on Japanology Plus, we'll explore the part kombu has played in Japanese cuisine and culture for millennia. Hello and welcome to Japanology Plus. I'm Peter Baraka. This wonderful view behind me here belongs to the city of Hakodate in Japan's northern island of Hokkaido. Hakodate started to flourish as a port about 150 years ago, and it's famous for its view, especially at night. The area around here is also famous for a kind of edible seaweed known as kombu kelp. Here I have some dried kombu, which is an essential ingredient in Japanese cooking. You add water to reconstitute it and make dashi, the soup stock which is used in countless Japanese recipes. The reason why it's used so widely is simply because it makes things taste better and richer and enhances other flavors. And this flavor enhancing quality is known in Japanese and increasingly in English as well as umami. Umami was actually first discovered in kombu. Let's start off with a look at just what kombu is. Currently, Japan's annual kombu production by dry weight is 20,000 tons. More than 90% of that comes from Hokkaido. The cold ocean currents that flow past its shores and the mineral-rich runoff from its vast, rugged interior nurture an abundance of kombu. Kombu is essential to Japanese cuisine. Chefs the world over have become intrigued by its power to enhance other flavors. Let's see how kombu is made into dashi the soup stock that imparts umami. First, dried kombu is placed in a pot of water and left to sit for 30 minutes to one hour. The flavor of the kombu gradually infuses the water. Then, it is heated gently while being skimmed from time to time. Just before the water boils, the strips of kombu are removed, leaving a pale golden broth. Overcooking must be avoided or the stock will thicken and taste harsh. Kombu has a long history. It is thought to have been an important source of nutrition in Japan since prehistoric times. About a thousand years ago, Kombu was a form of tax payment. The ruling nobility would use it in sacred rituals. Later, during a period of national turmoil, Kombu found favor with the samurai. Filling and portable, it made an ideal ration for soldiers, for whom it also served as a good luck charm. From the 17th century, advances in maritime technology enabled kombu to be shipped by sea from Hokkaido to points across Japan. This made it part of the general diet for the first time. Kombu also became associated with various important occasions in everyday life. It is among the engagement gifts that are traditionally exchanged before a wedding. Because a single stand of kombu can produce numerous fronds, it is associated with fertility. Kombu also contributes to the auspicious appeal of decorations for the new year. As both a vital element of cuisine and a token of good fortune, kombu is deeply rooted in the Japanese way of life. This week, our expert guest is one of the world's leading seaweed researchers, Professor Hajime Yasui. 
His studies aim to unlock new and untapped potential in kombu and other seaweed to benefit human health and happiness. First of all, Yasui takes us to Hakodate's morning market. Hakodate and Hokkaido in general is famous for having amazing seafood. And this market, which opens first thing in the morning, is one of the major tourist attractions here. If you like seafood, it's, you're absolutely in heaven in this place. I wonder how many different kinds of seafood they have in a place like this. It's incredible, isn't it? Around 1,000 wow. kinds. <laughs> oh. oh, and these are all different kinds of kombu. How many different kinds are there in all? There are over 110 kinds of kombu worldwide. More than 20 of them are found in Hokkaido. Why are there so many different kinds found in Hokkaido, I wonder? A very cold current, rich in nutrients, flows from the eastern side of the island of Hokkaido. And a warm current flows from the western side of the island. These currents mix around Hokkaido to create ideal conditions for kombu to grow. As a result, a very broad variety of kombu have taken root here. Mm. For example, some of the ones we have here, perhaps, could you explain what's special about them? This is called makombu. It's one of the best varieties and quite large in size. It's been eaten in Japan for about 1,300 years. It's very important in traditional cuisine and very pricey. What about this one, for example? This is Rishiri kombu. It's harvested mainly around Rishiri Island, but also in the Sea of Ochotsk. It's well suited to Japanese cuisine and is favored, for example, by Kyoto chefs. It produces a very clear stock. Ah, okay. This is Hidaka kombu. It's somewhat narrow and flat in shape. Kombu rolls that you find in Oden hot pot are made with this kombu. It's often used for wrapping fish and other foods too. A lot of popular dishes call for this kind of kombu, so it's widely used by many people. Mm. Oh. Thank you. This is a soup stock made from makombu. Mm. It's actually quite a, almost like a bland taste. It's very slightly salty, of course, because it comes out of the sea. But I think people might be surprised at how soft and quite delicate, really, the taste is. This is the traditional base for building flavors on. Mm. And it's good for you. It's especially good for the functioning of the brain. Probably have another two or three cups. <laughs> Every year, Hokkaido produces a harvest of high quality kombu. But there was a time when one community of kelp fishermen had their livelihood nearly wiped out. This is Edimo. The kombu from this town is known for its smooth flavor. Fifty years ago, the kelp forests the town depends on were nearly destroyed. In the late 19th century, Erimo's kombu harvests were famously bountiful. The shores were thickly forested at that time. But as settlers came to the area, they chopped down trees for firewood to survive the freezing winters and even dug up the stumps to burn. In no time, Edimo was turned into a treeless wasteland. This caused the bare topsoil to be blown into the sea, staining its waters red. The polluted water rotted the roots of the kelp, causing a vast die-off. Edimo was on its way to becoming a ghost town, but the Kombu fishermen set out to restore the kelp fields. problems could be traced to the exposed soil. To restore the ocean, they would first have to restore the forest. In 1953, they began leveling the barren ground and planting grass seeds. But Edimo has a harsh climate. It is one of the windiest spots in Japan with ferocious winds blowing at 35 kilometers per hour or stronger, 290 days a year. Even after three years, hardly any grass had taken root. 
Then one day, a local fisherman had a brainwave as he was looking at some seaweed beach rack that had washed ashore. Seaweed rack had long been used as a fertilizer in Edimo, and it had an interesting property. As it decomposed, it would stick to the ground. Can they use that stickiness to protect the seeds? Desperate for a solution, people spread the seaweed over the seeds. A week later, the rotting beach rack seaweed was clinging to the ground and sprouts of green grass were poking up through the seaweed. When they weren't busy fishing, locals would haul seaweed from the beach in carts and spread it over the ground. This laborious effort gradually turned 200 hectares of wasteland green again. By 1970, 17 years after the reforestation project began, the wasteland was completely covered with grass. Seedlings were brought in and the planting of trees began. Black pine was chosen as a tree well suited to cope with the fierce winds and dry soil. But a challenging obstacle remained. The huge amount of topsoil that had been blown into the ocean was still deposited there, inhibiting the growth of the kelp. Then, one day, one of Edimo's town elders recalled a legend. Once in a great while, an ice flow will come along and scrape the seabed clean. Everyone fervently wished that the legend could prove to be true. And then, in 1984, the wish was granted. A giant ice flow spread over the sea off Edimo, just as the legend foretold. Massive chunks of ice scraped along the sea floor, scooping away the deposits of topsoil. The next year, Erimo had an outstanding crop of glistening black kombu. As the forest cover expanded, fallen pine needles decomposed into nutrients that washed into the sea. It took 30 years, but finally the fishermen's struggle to restore their kombu was rewarded. Down there looks like a typical fishing village. So where are we and what does this have to do with kombu? This community is called Minami Kayabe. It's possibly the most famous kombu harvesting village in Hokkaido, in fact in Japan. This is where the highest quality makombu comes from. Minami Kayabe has the biggest kombu harvests in Japan. Its bay, formed by a volcanic eruption, keeps the inshore waters calm. The mountains send mineral-rich runoff into the sea that nourishes the kombu. The kombu is harvested during the summer. Special poles are used to wind up fronds of two-year-old kelp for hauling in. The harvested kombu is dried in the sun for two days. Drying locks in the flavor and helps kombu to keep longer. The practice goes back centuries. Kombu harvested in Minami Kayabe has long been greatly prized. It has even been given in tribute to the shogun and the emperor. Recently, strides have been made in kombu cultivation. Sprouts are grown for a month in special facilities, then transplanted to the open sea. Kelp cultivation makes possible a steady supply that tends not to be affected by weather or other conditions. It's turning kind of cloudy now. The cloudy weather that you're seeing right now, these conditions are actually typical of this area. And that is one secret of how delicious the kombu is. If kombu gets too much bright sun, 
it quickly becomes unfit to harvest. But having this cloudy weather most of the time lets it grow slowly and surely. And after being harvested, the kombu undergoes various processing that adds extra value to it. We visit the home of a kombu fisherman. Hello. Please come in. They make sure that the kombu is free of any grit. It's a very delicate process. So you start with this and you end up with about, it's about half, isn't it? It seems like a bit of a waste somehow. Look at the central part of this kelp frond. That's the middle rib. This is the highest quality portion. The quality drops off toward the sides. But the sides have their own appeal. They're used in other preparations, as an ingredient to season rice, for example. The middle rib provides a reliable, delicious umami flavor. It's mineral rich, nice and meaty. And towards the base of the front, where it's narrower, the quality is even higher. The tip is the oldest part of the front, and that has the lowest quality. But look at this part near the base. This is where the newest growth took place. The area near the base is packed with nice, young, succulent tissue. That makes it especially delicious. Once unwanted portions are removed, the kombu is ready to go to market. But some of it undergoes further processing. One example is kombu shavings. As you can see, something has happened and we're now dressed in stuff like this. Now, what we're witnessing here, I'm not quite sure what's going on. This is oboro kombu, a type of kombu shaving. Each shaving is a hundredth of a millimeter thick. What? It requires exceptional skill. I'm kind of interested to see what it tastes. Is it possible to eat it just as it is like that? You can eat it like this and it's delicious. Thank you very much. Wow. It's very thin. Look, look at that. It's, it's like wood shavings, only much, much softer, of course. That's right. Mmm. Oh, that's really tasty. Mmm. Wow, that, that's it's really quite a skill. How long have you been doing this for? This is my fifth year. Do you always do it the same way? Does it vary sometimes at the angle that you scrape, for example? It depends on the thickness of the kombu. Mm. I may have to scrape at a different angle. I have to adjust for each piece I'm working with. First, you want to step firmly on one end, a bit shorter. And now press this leg against your arm. Stretch the combo out a bit more. Oh, switch it. <laughs> it's really hard. Another five years or so, maybe I will get the hang of this. We'll see how we go. Hi, I'm Matt Alt. Now, when I hear kombu, normally I think about something to eat. But I've come out here to this tiny village in Hakodate where they tell me kombu isn't just for eating, it's for art. Let's go check it out. Kombu art. This looks like the place. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So, I hear this is a kombu art studio. Hi. That's right. Kombu art. Can you show me some of your work? I'd be glad to. Here are some pieces of mine. Oh wow, these are beautiful. Oh, is this a turtle? Yes, it is. And here's a crane. Ah, crane. Yes. How long does it take you to make one of these? Oh, about eight hours. I see. It certainly is time-consuming. You can't do it unless you love it. Kamiko Kosukegawa lives in Minami Kayabe. She began making kombu art 15 years ago. It all started when she accidentally dropped some dried kombu, making it worthless as a product. She wondered if she might be able to turn the damaged kombu into something beautiful. 
through a process of trial and error, she figured out how to make increasingly complex shapes using only kombu, including turtles, cranes, treasure boats, and other traditional Japanese good fortune motifs. These days, she is a successful kombu artist. Well, make this. Okay, what, what is this? It goes on presents for guests at weddings. I see. Well, this is, this is my first time making something out of seaweed, so where do we start? First, you cut nice straight strips of the thin part with scissors. It cuts very easily. It smells like the sea. Is this edible? Eat some and see. <laughs> but then we'll lose all our material. We've got plenty of seaweed. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Down the hatch. Hmm. It's a little hard. <laughs> yes. Okay, here we go. Okay. First, hold it like this and pass it through here. Oh, this is harder than it looks. Take the right end and pass it under here and out okay. through here. Wow, you're so fast. Done. The end sticks out here. Okay. Did you end up with a square in the middle? <laughs> well, mine's not as pretty as yours. <laughs> That's no good at all. Try again. Okay. Let's try this one more time. Like okay. this. This end goes through this loop. I, I think I see. Oh, I mean, Oh, wait, wait, I got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. Did it come out to the top? I did it! <laughs> a seaweed pretzel. No, actually, it's not a pretzel, but it kind of looks like a pretzel. Well, those were interesting. What's next? Let's make this. Wow, that's pretty. What, what is this? Pine flowers. Ah. Make a loop about this size. Okay. Make five like that. Okay. Oh, it came out nicely. <laughs> I did it. Halfway. Not easy, is it? Wait, I'm almost there. There's mine. <laughs> and there's hers. You make the call. Well, this is certainly a wonderful technique. Do, do you have any students? Is there anybody you're passing along these techniques to? Yes, I'm teaching my granddaughter. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much for showing me your techniques. It was my pleasure. Thank you for coming. Well, there you have it. Because we didn't have that much time, we were only able to make a few small things like this. But given enough time, anybody can be a seaweed superstar. It's fun and it tastes good too. Kind of like origami you can eat. See you next time. Mmm. With healthy Japanese cuisine booming worldwide, there is growing attention to some of the constituents in kombu. This is gagome kombu, and it's drawing a lot of attention in the kombu business these days. Its surface is indented with a rather strange pattern. Until recently, that put people off eating it. But then, 10 years ago, Professor Yasui did research on this previously unloved kelp species. Gagome kombu is much more sticky and gluey than other kinds. Research showed that phacoidans, a form of dietary fiber, are the cause. Phacoidans are important compounds that enable kombu fronds to repair damage from sand and other wear and tear, and prevent drying out when exposed at low tide. And phacoidans also turn out to have benefits for human health. Yasui's research suddenly put gagome kombu in the spotlight. Over the past 10 years, the economic impact in the region around Hakodate, where Gagome Kombu grows, has been worth an estimated 22 billion yen. There is still ample untapped potential in Kombu. What a feast. I, I hardly know where to start. But um, first of all, 
Let, let's see, is there the famous gagome kombu in here anywhere? This is it. Mm. See how viscous it is. Mm. Here we have seafood caught locally. Oh. Try some sashimi with this kelp sauce. Mm. Mm. Oh, it gives it a, a whole different taste again, doesn't it? Mm. This sliminess is due mainly to the high fucoidin content. Mm. Since fucoidins are a type of dietary fiber, they're good for keeping your digestive system in good shape. They clean things out, mopping up excess fats and so on, and flushing them away. Now, what else have we got here? Oh. This is a traditional Japanese dish. A little pouch of kombu mm. with vegetables and mm. fish inside. Mm. Young, supple, farmed kombu is used for the pouch. It has a wonderful, mild appeal. You can tell the difference between the natural kombu and the cultivated kombu by what? The, the color or the texture? Or... Natural, kombu. natural wild kombu is thick oh. and firm. Oh, oh. And it has a very strong umami flavor. Cultivated kombu is softer and versatile. It's well suited to many dishes. It's very mild. Mm, mm, mm. We still haven't tried this one here in the middle. I wonder what this is. A layered dish. So we got some kind of a fish in here again, and that's mixed with kombu in a sort of salady form. Mm. So refreshing. Mm. People around the world would love this dish. Of course, now we know that there are a lot of health benefits as well from eating seaweed, so perhaps we'll see it being eaten in other parts of the world as well. Eating seaweed has all kinds of benefits for the digestive system. It's also very effective in regulating blood pressure. And it can help to keep your skin in good condition. All these health benefits have been identified. So I hope people around the world will try seaweed and incorporate it into their lifestyles so as to take advantage of all the benefits offered by a seaweed-rich diet. Next time, hotels and inns. Lodgings in Japan range from traditional ryokan to one-person capsule hotels. We present some new variations as we explore the many different options. Your eye on